Like many, regrettably even in his hometown, I have only recently come across the name of Sir Hubert Wilkins, and his exploits, particularly his photos and films, have become almost an obsession in the four years since. This study has manifested itself in many works, including the first book to be done that curates all his photos, and a documentary that also includes extracts from some of his films, both under the name of The Eye of Wilkins. These, and what I hope will become everything Wilkins, can be found at my website honouring him at www.wilkinstheadventurer.com.au. What follows is made up entirely of images and films shot by Sir Hubert Wilkins. So Wilkins' first visit to Antarctica was in 1920, age 32, as part of an expedition led by an English doctor, a certain John Cope. It wasn't Bert Wilkins' first polar adventure. He had been on the Canadian Arctic expedition before the Great War, but both he found had flawed leaders. In what seems almost beyond belief in these days of protective parenting, Cope decided to take along a couple of volunteer scouts, but before they all got into hairy waters, the boys had been left for safekeeping on an island. However, when Cope ran out of money, it fell to Wilkins to rescue himself, the scouts and his own reputation, and so, for the required cash to get them all back to London, he took a gig from locals to film and photograph their country and lives, particularly on and about the whaling stations at the most southern tip of South America, producing images such as these. It was not a task that much agreed with him, but his options at that time were few. Sir so Ernest Shackleton's last venture to Antarctica left from London St Catherine's Dock captured in this film taken by Wilkins on 17th September 1921. The purpose of the venture was not as precise, but it brought together many who had been a part of his endurance fiasco of the previous decade, including the ship's captain Frank Worsley, his deputy Frank Wilde and medic Sydney cider Alex Macklin. Interest in this expedition had been non-existent until Shackleton came up with a brilliant marketing stunt of running a competition in an English newspaper for a scout to come along, the boy to be chosen by no less than Lord Baden Powell himself. As this film shows, by the time they set sail, the public fully embraced it. Wilkins' official role was as biologist, though he had no qualifications to be deemed one, not that that ever seemed to worry anyone. Wilkins would have gone on this trip as a deckhand, so in awe of Shackleton was he. Shackleton liked being referred to as the boss, and Wilkins rated him the greatest leader of men he ever came across. Macklin is of interest as he also took photos, and some of the best of the whole expedition exist only by his family donating his and those of Wilkins he in turn had given to Macklin to the State Library of New South Wales after Macklin's death. In my view, as a series, the photos taken by Wilkins on this venture were his best, showing a masterful appreciation for the boat, its crew, and the views possible from it. Though only 47, Shackleton likely harboured some serious health issues, which were exacerbated by the abysmal weather the venture suffered from almost immediately out of, in the channel to down the South American coast. The quest, the dilapidated Norwegian sealer being used, was never going to be up to the task, and the bad weather just highlighted its inadequacies. When the boat pulled into Rio de Janeiro for repairs, Wilkins went ahead to do some of his biologist work, filming and photographing wildlife on and around South Georgia Island, and these images were taken then. Wilkins went on to identify a number of new species of fauna and flora. When he caught up with the Quest, he found the ship's flag at half-mast. When the Quest sailed, only silent movies existed, but this film was re-edited ten years later when sound was possible, with the ship's captain Frank Worsley telling the tale of Shackleton's demise. And the parts of the mountains where he, Queen and I had crossed six years before. That night, Shackleton and I yarned until 10.30. We said good night, and he turned in his cabin, of which this is a photograph. At a quarter to three in the morning, he blew his whistle, and Macklin, the surgeon who was on watch, rushed in. He found Shackleton in great pain, and in quarter of an hour, the great explorer died in his arms of angina pectoris, heart disease. This is my original entry in the ship's logs. By Lady Shackleton's wish, we buried him in the little cemetery at Gritviken, which for more than a hundred years has been the last home of seamen, whalers and explorers. The spot he would have chosen to lie in, looking out the scenes of his great adventures, his great triumphs and what I might describe as his most glorious failure.
a spot swept by the elements among which so much of his life was spent. Wreaths were sent by Lady Shackleton and the British and various South American governments. I think that indirectly he had laid down his life for his comrades. His great exertions and self-sacrifices laid the seeds of the disease which caused his death. Our last service to him was to build a cairn to his memory and also to act as a guide to ships entering King Edward Cove. Our favourite A.B. MacLeod, a fine old Scot, took charge of the building operations because at his home they all know how to build stone fences and walls. As we dug out stones and sledged them down the mountainside, the sky became heavily overcast and soon it was blowing a snow blizzard. We could hardly see each other through the driving snow, but we carried on the work by following our sledge tracks. The next day our labour of love was completed and the sky cleared. We erected an oak cross three feet high on top of the cairn and into the front of the cairn we cemented a brass plate bearing the words, Sir Ernest Shackleton, explorer, died here January the 5th, 1922, erected by his comrades. After the ceremonies, the quest expedition went on, but without much enthusiasm from its crestfallen crew. When the quest threatened to do another endurance, they decided that was enough and the boat turned around and headed home. In 1928, Wilkins had teamed up with Ben Ileson on the right here, an introspective pilot from Wyoming who was somewhat of a legend in Alaska, and this plane, a Lockheed Vega. Together, earlier that year, they had undertaken one of the great feats of aviation, flying across the North Pole, and now Wilkins had plans for all of them in Antarctica. Wilkins had decided long before that attempts on the poles themselves by sled or even boat were foolhardy. Plane was the best option. Wilkins had also decided, after the Cope folly and the Shackleton failure, that leading your own well-funded mission was best. With aviation exploration at this time a worldwide phenomenon, this expedition was supported in part by the great newspaper magnate of his day, Citizen Kane himself, William Randolph Hearst. Before we get to that flight, this is film, probably the first time it has been seen in Australia, which features observations of the lies and activities of locals at Graham's Land, the closest point that Antarctica gets to the other land, in this case Chile. It was also where long days were spent undertaking scientific research with the locals more fascinated than threatened by their strange new co-tenants. Of interest perhaps that this is what these explorers termed Waterboat Point and was the place where Cope and Wilkins had in fact left their scouts eight years before. This excerpt features fishing and perhaps highlights the abundance of wildlife that exist or existed, much of which is hidden away out of view. As much as science was always front and centre for any Wilkins adventure, these expeditions had to pay their way. In 1928 there was a race on to become the first person to traverse Antarctica with the American Richard Byrd sponsored by the New York Times, believing only he should be able to pursue it. By this time Wilkins was then very much into what became known as the hero business, and up against gangsters fighting prohibition for headlines, pictures and film of dying fish weren't going to satisfy his backers. The British also became anxious that what they claimed as their own, thanks to the work of the likes of Scott, Shackleton and Mawson, was now under threat of becoming another's. In typical Wilkins style, he promised enough to everyone to keep his venture and credibility alive. Their famous flight on the 20th of December 1928 started from Deception Island after breakfast and ended when they returned just in time for dinner some 9 hours and 25 minutes later. Wilkins packed some provisions if they happened to come down unexpectedly, this had happened before on their Arctic flights, but in reality this was little more than the 1928 equivalent of flight cabin crew crapping on as they do nowadays about using the life jacket's light and whistle to attract attention. For any forced landing would have been the end, for nobody knew where they were and this was no terrain to either land on or then attempt to take off from again. But this one amazing airplane came through and on this flight Wilkins and Ileson discovered five new islands previously thought to be a part of the mainland and redrew an extraordinary 1,000 kilometres of coastline. As a result of these ventures Wilkins became both the first person to fly over Antarctica and to chart by air more new land than any other who came before or after. 
As unrecognised as Eilson and Wilkins are, nonetheless it was one of the great feats of aviation to add to their Arctic triumph of a few months before. In these places Wilkins found the words penned by Rudyard Kipling in 1922 in the Long Trail apt. We're aging south on the long trail where the shouting seas drive by and the engines stamp and ring and the wet boughs reel and swing and the southern cross rides high. Yes, the old lost stars wheel back, dear lass, that blaze in the velvet blue. They're all old friends on the old trail, our own trail, the out trail. They're God's own guides on the long trail, the trail that is always new. You have heard the call of the offshore wind and the voice of the deep sea rain. You have heard the song, how long, how long, pull out on the trail again. The Lord knows what we may find, dear lass, and the juice knows what we may do. But we're back once more on the old trail, our own trail, the out trail. We're down, how down, on the long trail, the trail that is always new. Lincoln Ellsworth, on the left was a wealthy American and strong supporter of Wilkins, having sponsored both his Nautilus Arctic submarine and previous Antarctica missions, as well as hosting Hubert and Suzanne for their honeymoon in his castle in Switzerland. However, in order to repay his debts after the Nautilus, Ellsworth pressed Wilkins to lead his ventures to Antarctica. As this image may suggest, being subordinate to another flawed leader did not please the Hubert. Still, it was one better than Ellsworth's pilot, Herbert Hollick Kenyon, seen here, who couldn't stand the guy. To attain the fame Lincoln Ellsworth craved as we reached the mid-1930s, the task was to fly across Antarctica from Dundee Island to the Ross Ice Shelf. By this time Wilkins had also given up on the thrill of flying across the polar regions. He had lost plenty of friends in doing that, including Ben Eilson, who crashed his plane back in Alaska not long after returning from Deception Island in 1929. Notwithstanding, as always, Wilkins wholly committed himself to the task, delivering Ellsworth his success, but there was only so much he could do. Otherwise, during these expeditions, Wilkins seemed to be treading water, doing not much more than taking further images of albeit spectacular ice forms and another stricken yacht. After two months, both Ellsworth and his pilot were rescued, but soon after Wilkins found an excuse to get back to the Northern Hemisphere and left Ellsworth to it. Ellsworth had land, a mount and a lake named after himself, it was not his habit to share around the honours to those who supported him. So a few other things to finish. In recognition of his extraordinary flight near to the tip of South America, there is an area now named Wilkins Sound, which takes in both the Charcot and Latali Islands, which Wilkins identified as being separate to the mainland. On one of his Antarctica trips, Wilkins came across an identified igneous rock such as this, which may signify the presence of oil-bearing rocks underneath. Fortunately, to now at least, nobody has been allowed to go in and start drilling. And finally, Wilkins never stopped his travels to the Great Southern Continent, with this photo taken in 1957, nearly 50 years after his first visit and just a year before his death, where he is seen with a beer bottle believed to be from a certain Ballarat Brewing Company, what we might now describe as a microbrewery. So Hubert Wilkins was an extraordinary man and Antarctica was perhaps truly his home away from home.